Thank you very much. It's quite a pleasure to share with you this afternoon about some idea about avoiding the media income trap. From the perspective of new structural economics, which I started to advocate, and I was the chief economist of the World Bank. We are in a country which has been growing very dynamically, like Finn and the deputy minister mentioned this morning. 20 years ago, Vietnam was one of the poorest countries in the world, measured by the per capita income at that time was only about 200 US dollars. But now, the per capita income in, in, in Vietnam reached about 1800s, one of the middle income countries. And uh, the inspiration for the country is how to continue to grow from the middle income to high income. But we know that most middle income countries have been trapped in middle income status for decades. And so that's a term, middle income trap. But I'd like to say, middle income trap is not a destiny. Because we observe some country like Ireland in Europe was trapped in middle income for a century. But starting from mid 1980s, all of a sudden started to take off. And now per income in Ireland, it's about 90, 95% of the US per capita income. And similarly, the East Asian economies like Singapore. Before the 1960s, the country was also trapped in the middle income status for a century. But starting from the mid 1960s, the country grow in very dynamically and become a high income country. And some economies, like Korea, in 1960s, it was a low income country. But the country was able to continue to grow dynamically and climb up to middle income and now high income. And if you look into these a few successful countries, in general, they were trapped. And all of a sudden, in a certain point in time, they started to grow very dynamically. And the reason why they started to grow very dynamically, in general, is not because of those conventional wisdom, they improve their institution, their governance, or even their education. Because those kind of elements, in general, are slow moving factors. But they started to grow dynamically over certain. And for this, I'd like to provide some kind of new understanding. How a country been trapped in low income status or middle income status for a long time and could have a change in their fate, started to grow in dynamically. And for this, I'd like to say we should go back to Adam Smith. When I say we should go back to Adam Smith, I do not mean we should go back to the wealth of nation. Because wealth of nation is some kind of summary of what he found is important to generate wealth. But I think more important is to go back to Adam Smith's approach to understand the nature and the causes of the wealth of nation. And for us, this topic is to understand the nature and the causes of dynamic economic growth so a country can avoid the middle income trap or low income trap. We know that dynamic economic growth is a modern phenomenon. Before 18th century, all the countries in the world has been stagnated for century, for a thousand years. And all of a sudden, in the mid, in the 18th century, a group of countries in Western Europe started to grow, you know, jumping from stagnation to have 1% per year growth rate, and then later on to have 2%, 3% growth rate. And this process was possible, everyone knows, was because of industrial revolution, which accelerate the rate of growth in technologies, and also to generate a series of new industries which were more 
you know, higher value added. And by this kind of technological changes and industrial upgrading diversification, we can continue to improve the labor productivities. But at the same time, you also need to have a continuous improvement in the hard infrastructure like power availability, port facilities, and institution in legal in financial sectors to reduce transaction costs. I think that is the nature of modern economic growth. It's a continual process of structural transformation in technology, in industries, in infrastructure, and in institutions. And I'd like to apply the neoclassic approach to study what are the determinant factors of economic structure and its evolution throughout the time. And according to the economics convention, I should call this type of study the structural economics. But because we know there was structuralism before, and to distinguish it, I call it new structural economics. And uh, my hypothesis is that country at different stage of development, their economic structures are different. For example, in high income country, in general, their economic structures is in the capital intensive, the technological intensive sectors. And low income country, their economic structures is in resources intensive, whatever intensive industries. And the difference in their economic structure for countries in different states of development, it's determined by their endowment structure. That is the amount of the labor force, natural resources, capital they have. And we know that endowment structure is given at any specific time and are changeable over time. And the endowment structure, in effect, is the total budget of a country has at any specific time. And it also has a relative abundance in labor, capital, and natural resources. So it also determines the relative prices of the capital, of the natural resources, and also labor force. And for economists, we know two of the most important parameters in our economic analysis are total budget and relative prices. And uh, endowments and its structure determine the total budget. And uh, the relative prices are different factors at any specific time. But unfortunately, except for trade economists, we haven't paid enough attention to the implication of economic endowment and its structure. From this endowment structure, we know at any specific time, those kind of structure determine what are the competitive advantage of the economy at that time. And if all the industry are consistent with their competitive advantages, its factor cost of production will be lowest. So they will be most competitive. And in that regard, the economic structure, the industrial structure, according to a country comparative advantages, should be considered as the optimal industrial structure at that time. Certainly, we are studying economic development. We want to increase the per capita income. If we want to increase the per capita income, certainly we need to move to the sector which with high level productivities and in general, they are more capital intensive and technological intensive. But since that industrial structure is endogenous to the endowment structure, if you want to move up the industrial ladders to higher level productivity so you can have higher income, you need to upgrade your endowment structure first. Certainly, if your endowment structure upgrades to more capital intensive abundant, you will have more capital intensive industry. But because of the economic scale, increase, market reach increase, and so on, you also need to improve the hard infrastructure and institution sub-infrastructure. And uh, when we say a country is trapped in low-income status or middle-income status, that means the country does not have a rapid enough change in its economic structure. So its labor productivity cannot have rapid enough increase and so they cannot narrow the gap with a high-income country. And then we say this country is trapped in low-income status or middle-income status. And from this simple analysis, we can also know the best way for a country to avoid the income trap, to have a dynamic economic growth, 
is to follow its competitive advantages in each stage of its development so they can be most competitive. And if they are competitive, they can generate the largest possible economic surplus. They can have the farthest accumulation of capitals. And if they have a farthest accumulation of capital, they can you know, upgrade their industries to higher capital intensive, higher level productivities. Certainly during this period of time, they also need to improve the institution and the infrastructure. By this way, they can be competitive. And by this way, as a developing country, they can also have the advantage of backwardness in terms of technological innovation or going to the new industries because they can import, they can imitate the existing technology or industry from high income country to reduce the cost of innovation and uh, risk of innovation. But to follow the competitive advantages in the development is a jargon only understandable to economists. But how can the entrepreneurs in a country follow this principle spontaneously? I think that we need to have an institution that is competitive market. Because if we want the firm to choose their industry or technology according to the competitive advantage of the economies, then you need to have a price signals, which can reflect the relative abundance of the capital and a labor and natural resources. If you have abundant natural resources or labor force, then the prices to those factors should be relatively low. And uh, if you have those kind of price signals, then from for the profitability, they will use more capital, uh, more labor force or more natural resources and enter into those kind of sectors. And then those kind of activity will be consistent with the country's competitive advantages. So market institution would be an uh, essential institutional precondition for the country to follow the competitive advantages. But we also need to have an enabling state there because economic development is a process of continuous structural transformation, technological innovation, industrial upgrading, improvement of institution and infrastructure. And in this process, we need to have the first mover to entering into the industries. First mover, we know we need to have incentive to the first mover in order to compensate for the externality that the first mover produce. And also the success of the first mover very much depends on whether you have those kind of desirable changes in infrastructure institutions. But individual firm will not be able to internalize all those kind of changes. So that's the reason why we need to have a state to provide the coordination of different investors in the improvement of infrastructure institution where the state need to provide those kind of changes by the state itself in order to facilitate the structural transformation. And if the state need to play a facilitation role, industrial policy should be a very helpful tool because the content of coordination will be different very much depends on what kind of you know, a, a new industry you want to develop. For example, if you want to go to, let's say, agro-processing, then some kind of core chain might be very important. But if you want to go to labor-intensive garment or footwear, then you know, electricity supply or port facility will be desirable. If the state has unlimited resources, can provide all the necessary improvement in the infrastructure for every possible industry, that will be fine. However, the government resources are limited. So the government needs to strategize the use of its limited resources and to make the necessary improvement in the sectors to facilitate the growth of new industries. So I think that industrial policy should have a very essential role. Certainly, we know that industrial policy is a taboo for a long time. The reason is because most of industrial policy failed. And the reason why most industrial policy failed is, is because in the past, the government in general was too ambitious. Try to develop industry which go against their comparative advantages. For example, in the import substitution strategy periods, the advice to most developing countries was to develop large scale modern industries which are so capital intensive on the basis of a poor agrarian economy, they did not have so, so ever comparative advantage in those kind of sectors. 
And as a result, those kind of industrial policy create a lot of sectors which look sexy, but firms in those kind of sectors were not viable in an open competitive market. And as a result, the government need to give them all kinds of subsidies and protections. And a subsidy of protection in general is in the form of all kinds of distortion and repression in the market activities. Another kind of distortion create rent and rent seeking and also cause misallocation of resources. That was the reason why the industrial policy in the past did not work well. However, so from our analysis, for industrial policy to be successful, let me repeat, for an industrial policy to be successful, the industrial policy should target sectors which the countries has latent competitive advantages. What do I mean by latent competitive advantages? The latent competitive advantages is that according to the factor cost of production, the country at the lowest level in the world. That means this sector is consistent with their competitive advantage determined by their factor endowments. But they are not competitive yet. Why come they are not competitive? Because to compete in the world, no matter domestic market or international market, it's a competition based on the total cost. But the total cost is also related to the transaction cost. And the transaction cost is determined by hard infrastructure, like power facilities, or port facilities, or available or skilled workers, or the access to finance, or foreign exchanges. And if those kind of you know, infrastructure or institution were not there, then the transaction cost will be too high. So even a country should have competitive advantage in that sectors, like Africa today. Their labor cost is so low, only about one-tenth of China's labor cost. They should have competitive advantages in labor-intensive industries. But they were not competitive, not because of factor cost of production. It is because our transaction cost is too high. Then the industrial policy to try to help the firm in those kind of sectors to reduce the transaction cost. And if the government can do that, this kind of industrial policy should be very effective, should be able to produce a lot of quick wins. But that then compare advantage it means that it's not there yet. And how can you identify the sectors which you have latent compare advantages? And I'd like to say, historically, all the successful countries in the catching up stages, they all have very proactive government industrial policy intervention, starting from 16th, 17th century, that when Britain wanted to catch up Netherlands, up to recently, like in the 1960s, that uh, 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 in the first small dragons, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore wanted to catch up Japan, or in the 1980s, China wanted to catch up four small dragons, and so on. That's one thing in common. The government industrial policy, in general, target industries. Currently, their per capita income is not too far away from them. It's about 100% higher than their per capita income. In the 19, early 20th century, in, our, in general, you target a country which their per capita income is about one third or one half higher than yours. But because technology will change very fast, now you may be able to target a country which their per capita income is about 200% higher than yours. That is something in common, I find. All the successful industrial policy, they are moderate. They try to catch up the industry in dynamic growing country, which their per capita income is not too far away. And if you look into the reason why most of the industrial policies in the past fail, because they are too ambitious. They wanted to target industries. In country, their per capita income is five times, even 10 times, or 20 times higher than yours. For example, in the 1950s, China, India all had automobile industries. At that time, automobile industry was the comparative advantage of the US. And China and India, their per capita income is only less than 5% of US per capita income. So that means they're 20 times higher. And that was the reason why the automobile industry in China and many other countries failed. OK. And why the industrial policy should target industries in dynamic growing countries with a similar endowment structure? Here, let me explain 
what do I mean by similar endowment structure? If you try to facilitate the growth of industry which are resources intensive, like you know, agricultural product or mineral, certainly you need to have those kind of natural resources or weather or soil. But if you are trying to you know, facilitate the growth of manufacturing sectors, and then you only need to look into the capital labor ratio. And the capital labor ratio you know, is a very good proxy for that is per capita income. So when I say similar endowment structure, if we are talking about the manufacturing sectors, then we only need to look into capital labor ratio. And that per capita income will be a very good proxy for that. And the reason why we need to talk is country which are growing dynamically and their per capita income is not too far away from yours. I think the reason is that the industrial upgrading is based on the upgrading in your endowment structure. In a country with similar endowment structure, their competitive advantage should be similar, right? And we know if a country growing dynamically for several decades, if a country growing dynamically for several decades, that means what? Almost all the industry in that country should be consistent with their competitive advantages. Otherwise, they cannot grow in dynamic for several decades. You know, if you, through the government intervention to develop certain industry which go against your compare advantages, you may be able to have an investment that grows for a few years. But other than that, you are stagnant, just like what we observed in the 1950s, 1960s. So if a country can grow in dynamically for several decades, then almost all the industry in the country should be consistent with the country's compare advantage. Otherwise, they cannot be so competitive. But if they are growing dynamically for several decades, their kept accumulation should be very fast. So many of the industry used to be their compared advantages, now they are going to be their sunset industry. But if your stage of development is not too far away, your compared advantage should be similar. So yours, their sunset industry will be your sunrise industries. So in this regard, the fast growing countries and their income level is not too far away. They are tradable, their industry is the blueprint of your late comparative, advantage, late comparative advantages. And we have another existing tool to do the industrial policy, and I don't have time to explain them, so I'll jump, skip that. And the best this understanding, the growth, you know, the, the new structure economics try to promote a framework for the country to do the industrial policy and to generate dynamic economic growth. The first step is that the country should identify fast growing country with similar endowment structure. And currently, their per capita income is about 100% higher than yours. Or 20, 30 years ago, their income level is similar to, was similar to yours. If 20 or 30 years ago, their income level was similar to yours, and they are growing dynamically, and their industry are consistent with their compared advantages, and those kind of industries should also be consistent with your compared advantages. Well, the third step, if we import a lot of goods from countries, their per capita income is similar to yours, and those kind of products should also be consistent with your latent compared advantages, because if other countries with similar income as yours, they can produce and compete internationally only import from them, your endowment structure is similar to theirs. So then you should also have latent compare advantage in those kind of sectors. So I have three criteria. One is that fat is growing country, their income level is about 100% higher than yours, or 20 or 30 years ago, you are in the same income level, or you import a lot of goods from other countries which are on your same income level. Then those kind of interviews should be your letting compare advantages. And this is very important. To understand a list of letting compare advantages, first you can avoid the government to be too ambitious, to make the mistakes, or to avoid being captured by the private sectors. Because for the private sectors, they have two ways to make profit. One is to increase their competitiveness or rent seeking. Sometimes the private sector will come to the government and say, well, this sector is so important, so you should protect us. But in fact, it's not for the modernization, it's for rent seeking. 
So the government need to have an understanding of at least of the products or sectors which are likely to be your latent compared advantages. And the best of those three principles I just mentioned. With this kind of understanding, the government come back domestic to see whether you already have some private sectors in those kind of sectors. If you have some private sector in those kind of sectors, your factor of cost of protection should be lower than your competitors. But how come you cannot be competitive? And what are the reasons why you are not competitive? You can do some kind of gross diagnostics or value chain analysis to see those kind of mining constraints. Then the government should help to remove those kind of mining constraints to facilitate the new entry with the scale of the existing firm. And this can have the advantage of incorporate the task knowledge which is emphasized by Ricardo Holtzman and also apply the, 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 the Daniel Rosick approach of gross diagnostic to see the mining constraint of the existing firm. But for a low-income country, it's not necessary that you need to have a task knowledge. In effect, if the sector is totally new to you, and as I argue, those kind of sectors should be the sunset industry in the reference country. So those firms should have the incentive to relocate their production to other countries with low wage rate. And so you are in a stage of development not too far away, they should have the incentive to relocate to your country. How come they have not? And what are the reasons? It may be because they don't know your country, so you need to do investment promotion. It may be because your infrastructure is not good enough or institution is not good enough. Then you try to identify those kind of mining constraints and help them to remove that and to persuade the foreign direct investor to come. So that's the third step. And this means that you do not have to confine yourself to jump into the trees which are only nearby, as you know, argued by the, 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 the Ricardo Hosman. The first step is that technology is changing so fast. Technology is changing so fast. So there are some sectors which did not exist 20 years ago, where well, every country has some unique endowments. And uh, in this regard, if you have some private sectors identify those kind of new opportunity and start to show the profitability, the government should also help them to remove the binding constraint and to scale up them or to encourage new entry. And one example was information processing business in India in the 1980s. It was a new firm of business. It did not exist before 1980s, but some India firm identified the opportunity. At the beginning, they used satellite for, they used satellite for telecommunication. It was very expensive, so they changed it to the then based telecommunication, dramatically reduced the information cost, and now it became the leading sectors in India. So that's the first step. Here that, when I talk about the gross identification and the facilitation, most people immediately jump to say, you know, you argue the government picking the sectors. But here you can see, in effect, the gross identification of facilitation is a process that the government is working with the private sectors. The government needs to avoid two mistakes. One is that the government might be too ambitious, or the government being captured by the private sectors. And the gross identification, the first step, help the government to avoid those kind of two mistakes, but in effect, Eventually, which sector will be developed in the country depends on the private sectors. Because step two, step three, step four are all determined by the private sectors. The government also, the only leader of the government there is to help the private sectors in those areas to remove the transaction cost. But as I said, developing country in general, by definition, they must have poor infrastructure. They must have poor business environment. Certainly, if the government has unlimited resources, then it would be desirable to improve everything for every sector. But unfortunately, the resource is limited. So one pragmatic way is to you know, develop industrial parks or spatial economic zone. Within the park and the spatial economic zone, make infrastructure good enough, make business environment good enough. And at this, you can create a partial localized good environment to facilitate the growth of sectors which you have latent compared advantages. So this is a pragmatic way of coordination. 
And this is also the reason why we see many dynamic growth in low-income countries like Vietnam, like China, like Indonesia. If you look into their general business environment, by the World Bank indicators, they were very poor. But they were able to grow very dynamically. It was because they were able to create this kind of localized good environment and to facilitate the growth of the sector which they had little comparable advantage and turned that into the competitive se sectors. And finally, you need to provide some incentive for the first mover. And the first mover, the purpose is to compensate for the externality. And so the incentive doesn't have to be large. Some kind of tax holidays will prevent your access to capital if you have you know, capital control, financial replacement. Or prevent your access to foreign exchanges if you have capital control to allow them to import the necessary equipment and so on. That should be enough. And so that is the framework I try to advocate for a low-income country to jumpstart the very dynamic growth path and to overcome the middle-income trap or low-income trap. And so let me conclude. The middle-income trap is not a destiny. If a middle-income country or low-income country can follow its competitive advantages to develop its economy, and uh, you can enjoy the late-comer advantage, then it can grow dynamically and uh, close the gap with the high-income country. And in this process, an effective market in order to provide right signal to know what kind of sectors are likely to be your competitive advantage well, that income per advantage is, is crucial. But the government also need to play an enabling role to facilitate the overcoming of high transaction costs due to the poor infrastructure or business environment or institution or governance. By this, every country should have a hope to overcome the middle income trap and uh, to grow dynamically and even become a high income country. And I have two books on that. One is new structural economics. The other one is the quest for prosperity. Thank you.